All right, welcome everybody. Rudy Montijo here. I'm your host of Day Trippin'. Um, episode six, as always, we're coming to you from the Merck Bar in Phoenix, Arizona. Ever in Phoenix, in the Biltmore area, ever want a cool lounge, a little bar, have a nice cocktail uh, with your partner, Merck Bar is a place to be. You just saw it. Very, very cool very place. Cool. Yeah. Been here for over 30 years, so a little hidden gem in Phoenix. Stop by the Merck Bar, support my friend Rick Phillips. Um, special guest today, his name is Mark Herman. We're going to do something different. We're going to do a little bit of a, of a two-part series. Mark has never done ketamine yet. Correct. Correct. So yeah. Mark is a firefighter. I'll let you tell your story here in a second. Yeah. So what we're going to do with this is this is part one. We're going to ask him a few questions and do a part two after his treatment. So those of you who have questions about what it's like, what you're looking to get out of it, I think this will be a good introduction for that for someone who hasn't done it before. Um, without further ado, Mark, what about yourself? Yeah, uh, Mark Herman. I'm 42. I've been on the fire department for just over 19 years. 19, uh, so you started young. Yeah, I was 22 years old when I started up. Okay. Um, yeah, coming to the end, you know, through just time and the things that I've been exposed to at work and, you know, some of the stuff we talked about earlier, I'm just, look, I'm trying to get to my 20 year point. Um, I've seen a lot of bad things on a busy department and, you know, I just was looking for a different avenue to try to deal with those things and bring them to surface so that way when I'm finishing up here, you know, I'm in a good mental space. And you work in. In Glendale, you in Glen, Yeah, I'm with Glendale Fire. Okay, yep. so that's a pretty busy department? Yeah, we're, for size of city, size of department, we're one of the busiest departments in the city. What are the most common things you see as a firefighter? I know certain people have, depending on the part of the country they're in or city in, might see different things. What's something common that you see on a daily basis as a firefighter? Um, I work in a lower economic area, so we, you know, we see a lot of, a lot of people on the streets, a lot of people that don't have help. Um, a lot of violence in the area that I'm in, it seems to, to come more about in those areas versus our areas that have, uh, have that are slower, don't have these kinds of calls that they go to. Um, but we do, we deal with anything from gunshot wounds, stabbings, overdoses, drownings, um, a lot of fires in our area too. It just, it, it's an array of things, but a lot of them are, they're pretty, pretty hard, pretty rash, pretty. So I want to go back to what you said you started at 22 years old. Mm -hmm. um, you said 22, then 23 is when you had the academy? Yep. Okay. So I know when I was 23, I was in my last year of college, um, a completely different mindset, uh, was still partying, doing all that kind of stuff. Now you're 23, you're a trained firefighter, you're responding to these gunshot wounds, to these stabbings, these motor vehicle accidents. Um, what's that like at that age, being exposed to something such so traumatic on a daily basis. Yeah, it's a lot to handle and the mentality in the fire service, I will say, is starting to come to a break where mental health is becoming a very important thing that they've identified that there's an issue there. But when I got on, the, the mentality was kind of, you know, this is life, this is how things happen, and you know, we just kind of move on, we go to the next thing. There wasn't a whole lot of self-check, like, hey, how are you doing? Are you all right with that call? Did stuff like that happen? Now we're seeing that shift, but when I got on, like I said, there wasn't that help. It was kind of like, this is what we do, this is what we see. Either you can handle it or you can't. You know, it's kind of those things that wasn't yeah. brought up to, like, go get help, go talk to somebody. More of a sink or swim. Yeah, sink or swim, compartmentalize everything, you know, leave it in and then find ways to, find ways to, you know, forget about it on your own time type of thing. So, what did you do if you, if you came across something or you're struggling with it mentally or emotionally, how would you process that or you, you wouldn't? Yeah, no, I think like at that age, I was of age to drink, so you would go out, you'd call up your friends, you'd yeah. go out, you'd have some drinks. Um, you wouldn't even talk about it then. You would just kind of, just kind of push it on the side. You would fill your time with other things to keep your mind busy from thinking on that. You okay. would, you would go into the next thing. Like you would go to paramedic school, or you would do something to be busy on your days off. So, so you would just you distract yourself. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, everything was to, to push everything to the back. And then you're married, have family. Yep, married. Been married for 15 years. I got three boys that are twins that are nine and an eight year old. Okay, so. Being exposed to all this in your daily job, um, how would your family say it's affected your mental health? Like as a person before and after, um, you were a fighter, fighter for several years before you met your wife and then had your kids. Yep. Um, 
what was that like and what was it like for them? Um, it's still, even to this day, it's still hard for them to deal with it. I'm at the point now where my kids need me home, they want me home. Um, they're always upset when I have to go to shift, but it did, it started to take a toll and it was one of those things that I didn't realize because again, you know, you put so many things behind you, you would just let the stress build. So it got to the point where about a year and a half ago, my wife had finally told me, she's like, hey, look, you know, we love you, but you're gonna have to figure something out. And if that means us not living here while you figure that out, I kind of was given an ultimatum. I didn't, it wasn't on the forefront of me. I didn't see it. I didn't realize that I was like breaking and going in a downward spiral. Wow. Yeah, that yeah, was pretty wild. So she gave you an ultimatum and not from, like most people get this because maybe somebody is like, someone had cheated, it was alcoholism, but it was simply your mental health was taking a toll. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Without getting too personal, as, as comfortable as you are, like what are some things that you were doing that you weren't aware of that they were seeing that was affecting that? Because it's for, for your wife to come in and say this, it's gotta be something big that's been happening over time, not just a one-time thing. Yeah, I mean, I would, the things that I've realized now is that I would I would push everything else off. I'm a very sociable person. I love meeting new people. It got to the point where I would distance myself from everybody, my own kids, my own wife. I would kind of just shelter in place and I wouldn't talk to anybody. My relationships with my friends um, kind of just went to the wayside. I lost a lot of friends. I guess I wouldn't say I lost them, but I just stopped communicating with talking with them. I became a different person. I was always angry, I was always upset about stuff, and these were things that my wife brought to the front. She's like, look, this is not the person that I had originally married, I don't know who this is right now. And I think it was just the abrupt conversation that she had with me it was what brought it, you know, brought it to light, was that I wasn't who I was, and I wasn't looking at it like that. And then when I stepped back just from that conversation, and I started looking at my kids and the relationship that I had with them, I was yelling at them for nothing, for just being kids. I was always upset at my wife for not doing something. I would come home mad before I had even met them, seen them, talked to them. I would just hunker down. I would just start cleaning things randomly. I had a conversation with someone yesterday about this, about uh, psychedelics and ketamine therapy and, mm -hmm. and how, and this is my hope for you, um, is how a lot of times it can reshape your perspective mm -hmm. on things and kind of make you more present in that family setting. That being said, I'm a father. A lot of our, our listeners and viewers our parents um, you always want to do the best you can and I don't think anybody intentionally tries to hurt their kids right. that being said I like to talk a lot about um, a mental legacy an emotional legacy I think the most valuable thing that you could give somebody is the skills to actually overcome adversity themselves uh, Jackie Chan has a great quote he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars martial arts star um, and when somebody asked him are you going to leave your fortune to your kids? And he said, no. And they're like, why? And they're like, well, if my kids are competent, they can make their own money. And if they're not, they're going to waste mine anyway. Mm -hmm. So what's the point? Um, when you see all this happening and your wife comes to you, as a dad, as a man, what does that do to you as far as like what kind of message you're sending you know, your boys as far as we lived in this past culture that you just talked about of, of shoving our emotions down um, about being more vulnerable and simply asking for help i speak about asking for help because it's the first step for a lot of things right. whether it's your partner whether you're an addict an alcoholic or mental health so what was that like teaching them not to ask for help or did you, were you aware of that I don't think I was aware of that uh, and I'm seeing it now honestly with my kids like we're working through some things with this and I you know like like you're talking about I realized at one point like I wanted to be that generational gap or break like I wanted mental health to be the most important thing um, I've tried to embody it now you know I try to do everything with intention and I try to take those things into consideration because I look at the trauma like we all I think we all have trauma but I look back at the trauma I had as a kid my dad passed away when I was six years old and somewhere in my life like I always wanted to be a parent. I knew I wanted to have kids but I knew I wanted to be a present dad. I wanted to be good and it was a real shock and it really just it bottomed me out when I realized that I wasn't doing those things. I, I fought so hard. My wife and I tried to have kids for five years. Um, we ended up having to do IVF. So I did a lot of things just to have kids and then to look back and think about the trauma that I may have created mentally with them with just like not being present, being angry and upset all the time. Um, 
it breaks you, like it makes you super emotional. And that's the thing that I realized too, is that I lost my emotion in this. Like some, as, as the calls build and, and life happens, like we all go through life and that's why it's called life. But as that goes on and, and takes, takes place of everything else, you start to forget about the reasons why you wanted to have kids and what you want. Like we all, we all have a picture of who we want to be as a parent. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I was not being that person. So now I try to dedicate every single moment I have with them to try to change the trauma that I probably created with being angry, upset, yelling. Um, you know, I still deal with these things. I have to take the time to talk to my kids now. But in the midst of trying to be better for them, I still put things, you know, I still let things build. That's what I've realized. That was one reason I wanted to go on this journey with the ketamine was that I wanted to find ways to be at more inner peace with myself so that I could be more focused and more present with my wife and my kids. Um, you know, coming towards the end of my career here, I think I'm very lucky. I'm gonna be 43 by the time I leave, and that gives me a lot of time, but I'm also concerned still, like the time I lost in between that with right. them, you know, and what kind of trauma I presented to them. Well, I don't want you to feel too bad. Um, I think kids are resilient. I'm a therapist as well, so like we all have some kind of trauma. We've all gone through something, but doing what you're doing right now is gonna change the trajectory of their path. I can tell you that. Um, going back to holding emotions down, having a partner. Mm -hmm. Again, a conversation I had with some friends actually just last night. Uh, my voice, little, little horse, I told you went to a Macklemore concert, so we were out pretty late. Um, but we we're having these conversations about family. And one of the conversations that came up with, with someone was her ex-partner, they didn't share certain things like he didn't share he wasn't vulnerable and so we're discussing this and there's this trade-off of being a man and holding a mask in the role mm -hmm. but also sharing your feelings and i've been in relationships where uh, one's happened and one didn't happen from my experience by opening up and sharing these things that we're kind of scared of because we think it's gonna um maybe lower mm -hmm. our our masculine side it actually does the opposite because it's more courageous and it actually increases the connection with your partner. Mm -hmm. That being said, since you and your wife started talking about these things and you decided to get help for your mental health and really owned it and said, you know what, I, I do have these issues. I want to get help creating these conversations in your home. How has that changed the dynamic and the closeness of your relationship oh, with your man, wife? Our relationship, like you, I, I try to explain this to her and it's still hard to explain it because there's no way to explain how much you love somebody. but when that was brought to mind in front and like I went, you know, obviously we self analyze ourselves. Um, I realized how much of an angel she was for me, like sticking around through all the stuff that I was putting her and the kids through and the things I put her through. Our relationship has become so much closer just now to this point. Um, man, she's like my Cosmo love. That's what I always say. Like, Cosmo love? My Cosmo love, man. Like, I don't think there's anybody else for me. Like we are best friends. Like, and we've always been best friends, but our connection now, just with her bringing that to me, I have, I've become more emotional. And I've found that that's a lot better for me um, because prior to that, with all of that, you know, in this profession is like, you're not emotional. Right. You're, you're just not that kind of person. You're not connected with you like that. You would like to think that you are, but you're not. You put all that stuff behind you and you don't think about it like that. You're either having a good day or you're just in a bad day. That's where I found myself. It was just, just like- black and white. Yeah, it was black and Not white. a lot of depth. Nothing in the middle, no. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's your intentions? What are, what are you hoping to get out of ketamine? What do you know about it? What have you heard? Are there any questions that I can answer for you and the viewers? Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking for that chance to be more present, more open-minded, um, and know that the things that I've been through and that, that are just parts of life and there's ways to work through that and just kind of finding those channels of how to find the happiness how to be more open, how to be more connected. Um, the things that I've found and that I've researched on this so far is like everything is looked up. Though. I haven't heard anything negative, right? So why would I not take the chance of doing something that's just gonna make me a better person, a better father, a better friend, better son? Uh, you know, I, I want that opportunity to open those doors and see where they lead me into. That's incredible. I'm, I'm smiling because I know how it's changed my life and the profound impact that it's had on my life and my relationships. Um, so I'm super excited for you. I got chills talking about it right now. Um, you haven't read a lot of bad things. Like we do a very good job at Day Trip of screening our clients. You just had a medical intake yeah. with an MD, Dr. Joseph Tefer, um, who's 
world renowned for, for psychedelics and, and his work in that field. But by doing that, taking that process, how has that made you feel more comfortable coming into Day Trip Health? You saw our clinic in Phoenix, Arizona, in Arcadia. Um, before you actually came in, I wanted you to come in in person, meet Dr. Tefer, um, see the clinic. How has that changed your perspective or reduced your anxiety as far as doing ketamine at Day Trip Health? Oh man, it's awesome. Like I was telling you when we were talking there, the vibe in there is amazing. It it makes you calm down right when you walk in the door um, from running water to the smell to the quietness in there and then just the the demeanor of everybody in there very inviting um, the doctor was great you know i gave him you know my ptsd issues and some of the things that i've that i had concerns with and what i was looking for and he reassured me you know when it was all said and done he's like hey i think you're going to be a great candidate for this with the things that you have where your health's at where your mindset's at you know he's like just don't forget to come into things with intention which is what mm -hmm. i try to do all the time um, but I love that word specifically when people are like, what is your intent? What is your intention? Um, it's it definitely that just that right there helped put me at even more ease with it. And they, it's not, he, you know, he talked to me about building into the dose, not doing something where we're going to put you in a position where you feel scared. It's going to be something that we're going to slowly like kind of bring you into so that way right. you know what you're getting into. So yeah, just completely put me at ease with it. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for you. Yeah, uh, thanks man. We can Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Our, pl our pleasure. Um, not too much else. I want to kind of leave it at that. I think the next time that we see Mark, it'll be after his ketamine session. So it'll be a different conversation. Um, I'm assuming it'll be a good one. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, so stay tuned for part two of Mark Herman, and we'll see you next time from the Merc Bar. Awesome. This has been Rudy Montillo with Day Trippin' and Mark Herman. Take care, guys. Yeah, thank you.